Okay, I'll be honest with you. Uh, there's like 200 pages of script for this video, so this may be multiple parts. All right, in this video, I'm going to be explaining this Dark Secrets of Islam iceberg that I made. I poured more than 100 hours of research into this chart over the past few months, and dude, let me tell you, just reading it makes you want to go take a shower. From strange miraculous tales to some of the darkest things mankind has ever conceived, this video has it all, backed up by evidence from authentic Islamic sources. Before we get started, I want you to know that this is a little different from your typical iceberg explained video. Usually the format starts with the most well-known things and gets into more and more esoteric topics. I'll tell you now that there are things in the beginning that nobody really knows about, and there are things at the end that are becoming more common knowledge, but this is because I sorted it more by how horrific they are, and also by how damaging they are to the Islamic world. So with that, let's dive in. No miracles? This refers to the common belief in Islam that Muhammad just didn't do any miracles. This is according to what the Quran says and according to common Muslim belief. Here's a couple of Quran passages that make this clear. They ask, why has no other sign been sent down to him from his Lord? Say, O Prophet, Allah certainly has the power to send down a sign, though most of them do not know. The disbelievers say, if only a sign could be sent down to him from his Lord. You, O Prophet, are only a warner and every people had a guide. They say, if only some signs had been sent down to him from his Lord. Say, O Prophet, signs are only with Allah, and I am only sent with a clear warning. Is it not enough for them that we have sent down to you the book, which is recited to them? Surely, in this Quran is a mercy and reminder for people who believe. The clear warning that's referred to in the last verse is the Quran. So the only miracle really in Islam is the Quran, not anything outside of it. But there's going to be some things from Muhammad's history that don't really line up with that, so let's see. Water fingers. This refers to a miracle found in the Hadith, the secondary authoritative texts in Islam. They're compilations of the life and sayings of Muhammad, and the greatest of these is Sahih al-Bukhari. Additionally, Sunnah.com lists out tens of thousands of Hadith in various compilations. Bukhari number 169 says, I saw Allah's apostle when the Asr prayer was due and the people searched for water to perform ablution, but they could not find it. Later on, a pot full of water for ablution was brought to Allah's apostle. He put his hand in that pot and ordered the people to perform ablution from it. I saw the water springing out from underneath his fingers till all of them performed the ablution. It was one of the miracles of the Prophet. Withered Fingers Aside from the Hadith, there is a book called The Life of Muhammad or Surat Rasulullah which was written by Abu Abd Allah Muhammad ibn Ashaq ibn Yasar al-Mutalibi. Got that first time, by the way. Otherwise known as Ibn Ashaq. The biography predates the Hadith by about a hundred years, and it's heavily relied upon to tell Muhammad's story. It's very important. When Quraysh perceived that the apostles' companions had settled in a land in peace and safety, and that the Neguz had protected those who sought refuge with him, and that Umar had become a Muslim, and that both he and Hamza were on the side of the Apostle and his companions, and that Islam had begun to spread among the tribes, they came together and decided among themselves to write a document in which they should put a boycott on Hashim and Mutalib, that they should not marry their women, nor give women to them to marry, and that they should neither buy from them nor sell to them. And when they agreed on that, they wrote it in a deed. Then they solemnly agreed on the points and hung the deed up in the middle of the Kaaba to remind them of their obligation. The writer of the deed was Mansur bin Ikrima bin Amir bin Hashim bin Abdu Manaf bin Abdul Dar bin Kusay, and the apostle invoked God against him and some of his fingers withered. If I had a nickel for every time we've talked about finger-related miracles today, well, then I'd only have 10 cents and that's not a lot, but it's kind of weird that it happened twice. Healing Eye Abu Dujana made a body shield for the apostle. Arrows were falling on his back as he leaned over him, until there were many stuck in it. Asim bin Umar bin Katada said that the apostle went on shooting from his bow until the bottom of it broke. Katada bin al-Numan took it and kept it. That day his eye was so injured that it lay exposed upon his cheek. Asim told me that the apostle restored it to its place with his hand, and it became his best and keenest eye afterwards. So Muhammad, the prophet who never did any miracles, did a miracle on the battlefield. Hey, it's nice that it's at least a healing miracle, that's good. But I gotta be honest, this is one of the only nice things that we're gonna talk about Muhammad doing. Water from a rock. 
Ibn Ishaq graces us with more interesting tales on page 608 of his book. Here we read, The apostle stayed in Tabuk some ten nights, not more. Then he returned to Medina. On the way there was water issuing from a rock, enough to water two or three riders. In it was a wadi called al-Mushakak. The apostle ordered anyone who should get there before him not to take any water from it until he came. A number of the disaffected got there first and drew water from it. When the apostle arrived, he halted and saw no water there. He asked who had got there first and was told their names. He exclaimed, Did I not forbid you to take water from it until I came? Then he cursed them and called down God's vengeance upon them. Then he alighted and placed his hand under the rock, and water began to flow into his hand as God willed. Then he sprinkled the rock with the water and rubbed it with his hand and prayed as God willed him to pray. Then water burst forth as one who heard it with a sound like thunder. This reminds me of the two water from rock miracles of Moses, and maybe that's what they were trying to get at. Walking Tree. This refers to yet another story from Ibn Ishaq. Here's a gem about, well, a walking tree. My father Ishaq bin Yasar told me, saying, Rukana bin Abdu Yazid bin Hashim bin Abdul Mutalib bin Abdu Manaf was the strongest man among the Quraysh, and one day he met the apostle in one of the passes of Mecca alone. Rukana, said he, why won't you fear God and accept my preaching? If I knew that what you would say is true, I would follow you, he said. The apostle then asked him if he would recognize that he spoke the truth if he threw him. And when he said yes, they began to wrestle. And when the apostle got a firm grip of him, he threw him to the ground, he being unable to offer any effective resistance. Do it again, Muhammad, he said, and he did it again. This is extraordinary, he said. Can you really throw me? I can show you something more wonderful than that if you wish. I will call this tree that you see and it will come to me. Call it, he said. He called it and it advanced until it stood before the apostle. Then he said, retire to your place, and it did so. Rukana apparently needed to be thrown in order to accept Islam as true. That apparently was enough to prove to him that Muhammad was telling the truth. But just in case, he calls a tree in order to stand in front of him. Like, what does that even mean? What does that do for the truth of his message? Healing camel. Muhammad allegedly healed a man's eyes, we already talked about, but apparently he has a heart for animals as well. So, great. Here we see yet more from Ibn Ishaq. Huab bin Kaysan from Jabir bin Abdullah said, I went out with the apostle to the raid of Datul Rika of Nakul on an old feeble camel of mine. On the way back, the company kept going on while I dropped farther behind until the apostle overtook me and asked me what the trouble was. I told him that my camel was keeping me back, and he told me to make it kneel. I did so, and the apostle made his camel kneel and then said, Give me the stick you are holding, or cut me a stick from a tree. Then he took it and prodded the beast with it a few times. Then he told me to mount up and off we went. By him who sent him with the truth, my old camel kept up with the rapid pace of his she camel. I just think the imagery of Muhammad poking a camel and then it being healed is kind of funny. Broken rock. So here we go with Ibn Ashaq yet again. I have heard some stories about the digging of the trench in which there was an example of God's justifying his apostle and confirming his prophetic office things which the Muslims saw with their own eyes. Among these stories is one that I have heard that Jabir bin Abdullah used to relate. When they were working on the trench, a large rock caused great difficulty, and they complained to the apostle. He called for some water and spat in it. Then he prayed as God willed him to pray. Then he sprinkled the water on the rock. Those who were present said, By him who sent him a prophet with the truth, it was pulverized as though it were soft sand, so that it could not resist axe or shovel. Honestly, I find all these miracles kind of strange. The Quran says that miracles were of no use since the people didn't believe in them anyway, so Muhammad wasn't sent with any miracles. However, the earliest and most reliable biography of the man has him doing this very kind of thing, and it says it's in order to prove that he's from God, and people are glorifying God because of it. A hundred year death. This refers to Quran chapter 2 verse 259 that says, Or are you not aware of the one who passed by a city which was in ruins? He wondered, how could Allah bring this back to life after its destruction? So Allah caused him to die for a hundred years, then brought him back to life. Allah asked, how long have you remained in this state? He replied, perhaps a day or part of a day. Allah said, no, you have remained here for a hundred years. Just look at your food and drink. They have not spoiled. But now look at the remains of your donkey. And so we have made you into a sign for humanity. 
in looking at the bones of the donkey, how we bring them together and then clothe them with flesh. When this was made clear to him, he declared, Now I know that Allah is most capable of everything. For whatever reason, his food was preserved while he and the donkey were not. And there's no mention of the city actually being restored or rebuilt during that century either. The man was apparently made into a sign for humanity, but this doesn't really work as a proof for anyone else other than the man in the story. No one else was present. Not super dark or strange, just kind of interesting. But then again, we are still in level 1. 90 foot Adam. This refers to, well, exactly what it sounds like. Adam was apparently 90 feet tall. Sahih Muslim is another collection of important hadith on the same level as Bukhari, or maybe a little bit behind. Here's what Muslim 2841 says. Allah, the exalted and glorious, created Adam in his image with his length of 60 cubits. So he who would get into paradise would get in in the form of Adam, his length being 60 cubits. Then the people who followed him continued to diminish in size up until this day. Ask yourself, is it really reasonable to believe that Adam was actually 60 cubits tall? That's about 90 feet. Do Muslims really believe this? Is this something that's scientifically possible in their eyes? 300 Year Sleep. This refers to yet another legendary story, but this one comes straight from the Quran. Did you know that the people of the cave and the inscription were of our wondrous signs? When the youths took shelter in the cave, they said, Our Lord, give us mercy from yourself and bless our affair with guidance. Then we sealed their ears in the cave for a number of years. You would think them awake, although they were asleep, and we turned over them to the right and to the left with their dog stretching its paws across the threshold. Had you looked at them, you would have turned away from them in flight and had been filled with fear of them. Even so, we awakened them so that they may ask one another. A speaker among them said, How long have you stayed? They said, We have stayed a day or part of a day. They said, Your Lord knows best how long you have stayed. Send one of you to the city with this money of yours and let him see which food is most suitable and let him bring you some provision thereof and let him be gentle and let no one become aware of you. If they discover you, they will stone you or force you back into their religion. Then you will never be saved. So it was we caused them to be discovered that they would know that the promise of God is true and that of the hour there was no doubt. And they stayed in their cave for 300 years, adding nine. Why does the story refer to two groups when previously it didn't really indicate more than one group? Why did God apparently warn them against being discovered and then immediately cause them to be discovered, thus causing them to apparently be forced into pagan religion? It seems to switch subjects several times. Is there any significance to the length of stay being exactly 309 years? Anyway, on to more weird stories. Running Rock. This next one is just a funny legendary story about Moses, and I think it goes to show in one sense the fixation the Islamic texts have on bodies, sex, and sexuality. Narrated Abu Huraira. The prophet said, The people of Bani Israel used to take bath naked all together, looking at each other. The prophet Moses used to take bath alone. They said, By Allah, nothing prevents Moses from taking a bath with us except that he has a scrotal hernia. So once Moses went out to take a bath and put his clothes over a stone, and then that stone ran away with his clothes. Moses followed that stone, saying, My clothes, O stone, my clothes, O stone, till the people of Bani Israel saw him and said, By Allah, Moses has got no defect in his body. Moses took his clothes and began to beat the stone. Abu Huraira added, By Allah, there are still six or seven marks present on that stone from the excessive beating. There's a lot going on here. For some reason, apparently the many thousands of people in the nation of Israel used to take a bath all at the same time just looking at each other, and Moses was alone in his hygienic rituals. The people spoke ill of Moses behind his back, claiming he had some kind of genital defect, so he was ashamed to take a bath with anybody else. And in order to prove this wasn't the case to them, Allah caused a rock to run away from Moses. So he ran naked in front of all of Israel, children included, so they could see he was all good down there. Camel Prophet. This refers to you the several Quran verses talking about the people of Tamud and the camel that apparently appeared to them as a prophet. Tamud rejected the truth out of arrogance when the most wicked of them was roused to kill the she-camel. But the Messenger of Allah warned them, Do not disturb Allah's camel and her turn to drink. Still they defiled him and slaughtered her. So their Lord crushed them for their crime, leveling all to the ground. Chapter 91, verse 11 of the Quran says that the Tamud people rejected the truth. 
but the truth is spoken to people by a long succession of prophets. Additionally, the camel is a warning to the people in Quran 54.23. But to these people, camels would have been commonplace. So what would set apart this camel so that people would know it's a sign from God? Also, how would they have heard the decree from Allah to not touch the camel? Could it be that this camel was a prophet herself? And Allah caused a she-camel to be his prophet to speak to others? How could the people of Tamud understand their place with God if all he did to them was tell them not to touch a camel? This seems overly legalistic and unapplicable to people today. Why would God's word be so confusing? No insults. This next passage is really, really important. From Ibn Ashaq we read, Abu Jahl met the apostle, so I have heard, and said to him, By God, Muhammad, you will either stop cursing our gods or we will curse the god you serve. So God revealed concerning that, Curse not those to whom they pray other than God, lest they curse God wrongfully through lack of knowledge. I have been told that the apostle refrained from cursing their gods and began to call them to Allah. This is a statute that Muslims still uphold at least somewhat today. The point is that Muslims aren't allowed to curse those who aren't believers, since if they curse unbelievers, those people might curse God in retaliation. This applies to actions that Muslims commit as well. However, many modern Muslims don't seem to be aware of Allah's decrees or they don't care for them, since you have people like Muhammad Hijab who curse non-believers and thus bring curses upon Allah. Anytime you see someone like David Wood purposely destroying or eating a Quran, this is why. Here's some real things Muhammad Hijab and Ali Dawa have said and done. See it for yourself if they put Allah in a good light in the eyes of unbelievers. If you look just at the Quran, you will get the indication that you can have sexual intercourse with a five-year-old. This bastard, this boy, Call him a boy. No, 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 the bastard. You are pfft, Ali. You are pfft, Ali. You are nothing, do you understand? If you want to come and speak to me like that. And popular social media apologists like Muhammad Ajab are using some of their time to spew perverse sexual suggestions, while Ali Dimwit also practices his spit skills, just like Hijab taught him. Don't talk about weapons, I will that? spit directly in your face. Right now, I'll spit okay, in you your face. Okay, you beat the woman. Oh, pfft, Ali. A spit. He even pulled the chair out from under Hatun, so she fell to the ground. Miriam slash Mary. This refers to the mistake that the Quran makes with mixing up Mary and Miriam. And we have a few verses to read. The wife of Imran said, My lord, I have vowed to you what is in my womb, dedicated, so accept from me. You are the hearer and knower. And when she delivered her, she said, My lord, I have delivered a female. And God was well aware of what she had delivered. And the male is not like the female, and I have named her Mary, and have commended her and her descendants to your protection from Satan the outcast. The angel said, O oh Mary, God has chosen you and has purified you. He has chosen you over all the women of the world. And Mary, the daughter of Imran, who guarded her womb, and so we breathed into her of our spirit, and she believed in the truth of her Lord's words and his books, and was one of the devout. Then she came to her people, carrying him. They said, O oh Mary, you have done something terrible. O oh sister of Aaron, your father was not an evil man, and your mother was not a whore. So she pointed to him. They said, How can we speak to an infant in the crib? He said, I am the servant of God. He has given me the scripture and made me a prophet, and has made me blessed wherever I may be, and has enjoined on me prayer and charity so long as I live. Mary is apparently the sister of Aaron as well but any Bible reader can see the mistake. The name Mary is related to the name Miriam because it comes from it, and Aaron did have a sister by this name, but she wasn't the mother of Jesus. Dul Karnain. Here's another character in Islam that has some big questions surrounding him. Let's read. And they ask you about Dul Karnain. Say, I will tell you something about him. We established him on earth and gave him all kinds of means. He pursued a certain course. Until, when he reached the setting of the sun, he found it setting in a murky spring, and found a people in its vicinity. We said, O oh, Zulkarnain, you may either inflict a penalty or else treat them kindly. Then he pursued a course. Until, when he reached the point separating the two barriers, he found beside them a people who could barely understand what is said. They said, O oh, Zulkarnain, the Gog and Magog are spreading chaos in the land. Can we pay you to build between us and them a wall? He said, what my Lord has empowered me with is better, but assist me with strength, and I will build between you and them a dam. Bring me blocks of iron. 
so that when they had leveled up between the two cliffs, he said, Blow. And having turned it into a fire, he said, Bring me tar to pour over it. So they were unable to climb it, and they could not penetrate it. It's commonly believed in Islam that this is describing Alexander the Great. Never mind the fact that the Quran describes the sun setting in a way that's completely unscientific, or that there's a brass wall here between Gog and Magog, which we'll get to in a minute. Why is he called Zulkarnain? So there are multiple possible solutions, but the one I have highlighted is a common one that's been discussed for over a hundred years now. Some say that since two generations were elapsed during his era, each generation consisted of a hundred years. The article actually gets this wrong. The argument wasn't that two 100-year generations passed in his era, but that two full generations passed within his lifetime. Alexander the Great died at 33, so this is mathematically impossible. And even if you take what this article says, his era didn't last 200 years. The empire he was built on shattered as soon as he died. This is wrong either way you look at it. Brass Wall this refers to the brass wall that Zulkarnain built between Gog and Magog, and there's more problems here. As we read a minute ago, Alexander the Great apparently built a gigantic wall between a certain people and Gog and Magog. There is no record of such a wall being built by Alexander, and Gog and Magog existed thousands of years before Alexander. This is a total mystery, Haman's tower. This refers to Haman building a tower. Haman is another biblical character that gets some treatment in the Quran. Indeed, we sent Moses with our signs and compelling proof to Pharaoh, Haman, and Korah, but they responded, Magician, total liar. We also destroyed Korah, Pharaoh, and Haman. Indeed, Moses had come to them with clear proofs, but they behaved arrogantly in the land, yet they could not escape us. Pharaoh here is the same Pharaoh the Bible mentions during the Exodus. I keep mentioning the relationship between certain characters' portrayal in these books because the Quran is described as being the protector of the Bible. Therefore, if they mention certain biblical characters, we should expect the stories to line up. But as with the other ones, they don't line up at all. In the Bible, Haman is an Agagite. He came centuries after King Saul, who in turn came centuries after the Exodus. There is no other Haman mentioned that the Quran could be referring to, so it just straight up gets the timing of Haman wrong. Pharaoh declared, O chiefs, I know of no other god for you but myself. So bake bricks out of clay for me, O Haman, and build a high tower so I may look at the god of Moses, although I am sure he is a liar. Pharaoh also tells Haman to build a tower to reach heaven. This sounds a lot like the Tower of Babel, which is again centuries removed from Pharaoh and Haman both. This timeline is all over the place. How can the Quran be trusted as the protector of the Bible if there's so much wrong here? Critical thinking. Did you know that the Ottoman Empire banned the printing press within their territory for almost 300 years once it was invented? One of the best inventions in the history of the world for the general spread of information was purposefully left out of the hands of Muslims because the empire was worried that it would decrease their revenue and the religious loyalty of their subjects. Prophet Seal. This refers to the apparent seal of the prophet on Muhammad's back. Modern Muslims say that Muhammad was prophesied in the Bible in various places, and that's really outside the scope of this video, but they at least used to claim that a certain part of Muhammad was prophesied in the Bible as well, literally a certain part, from Ibn Ashaq. This is a story in Muhammad's youth when a bunch of people gathered together for a meal, so we're going to pick up together there. So they gathered together with him, leaving the apostle of God behind with the baggage under the tree on account of his extreme youth. When Bahira looked at the people, he did not see the mark which he knew and found in his books. So he said, Do not let one of you remain behind and not come to my feast. One of the men of Quraysh said, By Allah and al Uzza, we are to blame for leaving behind the son of Abdullah bin Abdul Mutalib. Then he got up and embraced him and made him sit with the people. When Bahira saw him, he stared at him closely, looking at his body and finding traces of his description in the Christian books. When the people had finished eating and had gone away, Bahira got up and said to him, Boy, I ask you by Alat and al Uzza to answer my question. So he began to ask him about what happened in his sleep and his habits and his affairs generally, and what the Apostle of God told him coincided with what Bahira knew of his description. Then he looked at his back and saw the seal of prophethood between his shoulders in the very place described in his book. And here is another example. 
Then I came to the apostle when he was in Baki ul Garkad, where he had followed the bier of one of his companions. Now I had two cloaks, and as he was sitting with his companions, I saluted him and went round to look at his back, so I could see whether the seal which my master had described to me was there. When the apostle saw me looking at his back, he knew that I was trying to find out the truth of what had been described to me, so he threw off his cloak, laying bare his back, and I looked up at the seal and recognized it. Then I bent over him, kissing him and weeping. All right, let's break this down real quick. A Christian man named Bahira looked Muhammad over closely and apparently saw features of his body that were mentioned in the scriptures. Chief among them was the seal of prophethood, which was a spot of some sort between Muhammad's shoulders. How could we possibly know this proves Muhammad was who he says he was? This is of no use to Muslims at all today, nor to non-believers, because, surprise, surprise, Muhammad is dead. We can't look at his back. Annoyance. This one is not a particularly nasty, dirty, or evil deed. It's just kind of disappointing. O believers, do not enter the homes of the prophet without permission. And if invited for a meal, do not come too early and linger until the meal is ready. But if you are invited, then enter on time. Once you have eaten, then go your way and do not stay for casual talk. Such behavior is truly annoying to the prophet, yet he is too shy to ask you to leave. But Allah is never shy of the truth. And when you believers ask his wives for something, ask them from behind a barrier. This is purer for your hearts and for theirs. And it is not right for you to annoy the messenger of Allah, nor to ever marry his wives after him. This would certainly be a major offense in the sight of Allah. Now we'll get to the second half of this passage later. We're just looking at the first half right now. Think about it. The Quran is apparently the eternal word of God. This is not meant in the same sense as the Christians say. The Muslim idea of the eternal word of God means that these very words, the ones we are reading right now, were in existence with Allah in heaven eternally. They were never created. They've been around forever. So knowing that these words come from God himself and have existed from all eternity, why does this verse specifically tell people not to annoy or bother Muhammad? Did God really need to have all that written down eternally? And how is it applicable to people today? As I just said a minute ago, Muhammad is dead. This doesn't apply anymore. Shouting food. This is pretty much exactly how it sounds. From the Hadith of Bukhari. We used to consider miracles as Allah's blessings, but you people consider them to be a warning. Once we were with Allah's apostle on a journey and we ran short of water. He said, bring the water remaining with you. The people brought a utensil containing a little water. He placed his hand in it and said, Come to the blessed water, and the blessing is from Allah. I saw the water flowing from among the fingers of Allah's apostle, and no doubt we heard the meal glorifying Allah when it was being eaten by him. So we already covered the water flowing from his hands. You know, this is another example of that happening again. But look at the last sentence. Apparently when a meal was being eaten by Muhammad, his followers heard that meal glorifying a lot. Multiple intestines. Yeah, this one's just really weird. As a side note, if your religion is so legalistic that in order to get to heaven you need to follow entire chapters of rules about food, maybe you should reconsider things. From the Hadith collection, Sunan ibn Majah, it was narrated from Ibn Umar that the Prophet said, the disbeliever eats with seven intestines, and the believer eats with one intestine. This gives me a chance to talk about hadith grading. Chances are that many of the hadith in this video will be disregarded or thrown out, since the Muslims are just going to say that it doesn't have a good chain of narration, so it can't be trusted. The isnad is the chain of narration, and it needs to go back to Muhammad or someone trustworthy in order for Muslims nowadays to say that it's legit. The best grade for this is sahi. Sahi means it's been transmitted through an unbroken chain of narrators, all of whom are of sound character and memory. Hassan means it's been transmitted through an unbroken chain of narrators, all of whom are of sound character, but they have weak memory. Daif means it's a hadith which can't gain the status of Hassan or Sahi because it lacks one or more elements of a Hassan hadith, whether it's the narrators are bad character or bad memory or the chain of narration is broken. Maudu is a hadith that has been fabricated and wrongly ascribed to Muhammad. 
We won't see really many of those graded like that in this video. Actually, I don't think any are. The hadith we just looked at, which says that disbelievers have seven intestines, is in the category of the most reliable hadith. Garlic and onions. Yeah, this is actually in here. It's in line with the whole legalistic thing that I just mentioned about food. Bukhari 5452 says, The Prophet said, Whoever has eaten garlic or onion should keep away from us, or should keep away from our mosque. Here's another hadith about this. Surprisingly, there's another one out there. Sunan Abi Dawud 3827 says, Narrated Muwaya ibn Kura, The messenger of Allah forbade these two plants, garlic and onions, and he said, He who eats them should not come near our mosque. If it is necessary to eat them, make them dead by cooking, that is, onions and garlic. What's the point of this? And guess what? It's another Sahih translation. Chess condemned. And yeah, this is also exactly what it sounds like. This is in reference to Muhammad condemning chess. And forgive me, there's going to be some long Arabic names in this one. Mishkat al-Masabi is a collection of hadith by uh, this guy. Wali ad-Din Abu Abd Allah Muhammad ibn Abd Allah al-Khatib al-Tibrizi. Gesundheit. And it's a revised version of the Masabi as sunnah by uh, this guy. Abu Muhammad al Hussein ibn Masud ibn Muhammad al Farah al Bagawi. Al Bagawi died 500 years after the time of Muhammad, and At Tibrizi died 600 years after Muhammad's time. Mishkat al Masabi was specifically created to make the text more accessible to those that don't have the advanced science knowledge of the grading of Hadith. Ali used to say that chess is the maysir of the foreigners. Ibn Shahab told that Abu Musa al-Ashari used to say that only a sinner plays chess. He told that when asked about playing chess, he replied that it pertains to what is worthless and that God does not like what is worthless. Maysir means gambling. Chess isn't gambling. The game itself doesn't have any gambling in it. Anyway, on we go to an apparent superpower of Muhammad. Choking Satan. This refers to Muhammad choking Satan. Bukhari 1210 says, Narrated Abu Huraira, The Prophet once offered the prayer and said, Satan came in front of me and tried to interrupt my prayer, but Allah gave me an upper hand on him and I choked him. No doubt I thought of tying him to one of the pillars of the mosque till you get up in the morning and see him. Then I remembered the statement of Prophet Solomon, My Lord, bestow upon me a kingdom such as not shall belong to any other after me. Then Allah made him, Satan, return with his head down, humiliated. This is the first of many hadith we'll be talking about that regard Satan. There's three reasons this one is weird. Muhammad was apparently able to physically overpower Satan when he tried to interrupt his prayer, but as we'll see much later on, Satan was able to overpower the mind of Muhammad and cause him to do something terrible. This hadith claims that Satan has a physical body, you know, because Muhammad wrestled him and choked him, which is weird since other hadith describe Satan doing things that are impossible with a physical body. Satan's also described as being in multiple places at once, which we'll see later on, but that can't work if he's able to be tied to a mosque pillar. Muhammad's chest. This is a reference to a really gross thing that happened between Muhammad and Gabriel and Muhammad's chest. Sunan en Nasai 452 says, It was narrated from Anas bin Malik that the prayers were enjoined in Mecca, and that two angels came to the messenger of Allah and took him to Zamzam, where they split open his stomach and took out his innards in a basin of gold and washed them with Zamzam water, then they filled his heart with wisdom and knowledge. Sahih al-Bukhari 1636 says, Allah's messenger said, The roof of my house was made open while I was at Mecca on the night of the mirage, and Jibril descended. He opened up my chest and washed it with the water of Zamzam. Then he brought the golden tray full of wisdom and belief and poured it in my chest and then closed it. Sunan and Nasai and al-Bukhari agree that Muhammad's chest was split open and his innards were washed clean. He was also given wisdom and belief before being closed up again. If this is a physical event, I can imagine why Muhammad would be afraid of Gabriel doing that to him. But if it's metaphorical, meaning that Muhammad was washed clean of sin, well, you still have problems. Many of those problems are further down this iceberg. Long story short, after this time in Mecca, Muhammad did not cease to sin. Oh boy, didn't he. Yawning. I think about this hadith a lot.
Sahih al-Bukhari 3289 says, Narrated Abu Huraira, The Prophet said yawning is from Satan, and if any one of you yawns, he should check his yawning as much as possible. For if any of you during the act of yawning should say, Ha! Satan will laugh at him. Imagine being a part of a religion where you have to, um, sorry, check your yawning. Even more inexplicable than that is this next hadith. Narrated Abu Huraira, the Prophet said, Allah loves sneezing but dislikes yawning. So if any one of you sneezes and praises Allah, every Muslim who hears him praising Allah has to say tashmit to him. But as regards yawning, it is from Satan. So if one of you yawns, he should try his best to stop it. For when any one of you yawns, Satan laughs at him. Crying tree. This refers to yet another strange story of some kind of anthropomorphic tree. Sahih al-Bukhari 2095. Narrated Jabra bin Abdullah. An Ansari woman said to Allah's apostle, O oh, Allah's apostle, shall I make something for you to sit on as I have a slave who is a carpenter? He replied, If you wish. So she got a pulpit made for him. When it was Friday, the prophet sat on that pulpit. The date palm stem near which the prophet used to deliver his sermons cried so much so that it was about to burst. The prophet came down from the pulpit to the stem and embraced it and it started groaning like a child being persuaded to stop crying, and then it stopped crying. The prophet said, It has cried because of missing what it used to hear of the religion's knowledge. Gabriel's Wings This is in reference to the number of Gabriel's wings, as read in Sahih Muslim 174c. Certainly he saw of the greatest signs of Allah imply that he saw Gabriel in his original form and he had 600 wings. Truly, a biblically accurate angel. Prayer looking up. This refers to praying looking up instead of praying with your head on the floor. You ever wondered why Muslims put their head on the floor when praying? Or have you ever heard Muslims say that Jesus was one of them because he had prayed while putting his head down one time? Well, maybe this hadith will give you some explanation of it. From Sahih Muslim 429, Abu Hurairah reported, people should avoid lifting their eyes toward the sky while supplicating in prayer, otherwise their eyes would be snatched away. Muslims pray with their heads on the floor because they're threatened to do so. Praying with your eyes looking up will either make you go blind or just take your eyes away entirely. Never mind the fact that Muhammad once prayed looking up, but that's also coming later. Monkey stoning. This refers to, well, the stoning of a monkey. It's kind of a funny story from Muhammad's life. Narrated Amr bin Maimun, During the pre-Islamic period of ignorance, I saw a she-monkey surrounded by a number of monkeys. They were all stoning it because it had committed illegal sexual intercourse. I too stoned it along with them. Why does God's religion need stoning of monkeys? Villager monkeys. Ask them, O prophet, about the people of the town which was by the sea, who broke the Sabbath. During the Sabbath, abundant fish would come to them clearly visible, but on other days the fish were never seen. In this way, we tested them for their rebelliousness. When some of the righteous among them questioned their fellow Sabbath keepers, why do you bother to warn those Sabbath breakers, who would either be destroyed or severely punished by Allah? They replied, just to be free from your Lord's blame, and so perhaps they may abstain. When they ignored the warning they were given, we rescued those who used to warn against evil and overtook the wrongdoers with a dreadful punishment for their rebelliousness. But when they stubbornly persisted in violation, we said to them, Be disgraced, apes! So a certain village only had fish appearing on the Sabbath in order to test their faith. They weren't allowed to do work, but the only day work was even possible was on the Sabbath. So in order to, you know, eat, some broke the Sabbath. And so Allah turned them into monkeys, or apes. This seems like Allah purposely stacked the deck against them and then punished them for it. Changing Qibla. This refers to, well, the changing of the Qibla, which is the direction of prayer. Did you know that modern Muslims can buy prayer mats with compasses built in them to make sure they always pray towards Mecca? If it's so important in Islam to make sure that you're facing Mecca when you pray, why did they used to face Jerusalem? The ignorant among the people will say, what has turned them away from the direction of prayer they once followed? Say, to God belong the east and the west. He guides to whom he wills a straight path. We have seen your face turn towards the heavens, so we will turn you toward a direction that will satisfy you. So turn your face toward the sacred mosque, and wherever you may be, turn your faces towards it. Here are the passages that tell Muslims to face Mecca when they pray. 
This is pretty obvious. Does it bother anybody else, though, that Muhammad is described here as turning his face towards heaven when he prays? I thought his eyes were supposed to be snatched away. Anyway, this passage is a defense against people like me, who question the changing of the Qibla, since it says here in verse 142 that to God belong the east and the west. Essentially, it says that God can do what he wants. He can change the Qibla whenever he wants. But I bet you didn't know what Ibn Ashaq and At-Tabari have to say about this. Tabari, a Muslim historian, describes certain events that happened in the second year after the move from Mecca to Medina that Muhammad and his followers took. One of these is God's changing of the Muslims' Qibla, the direction faced in prayer, from Syria, that is, Jerusalem, to the Kaaba. This was in the second year of the Prophet's residence in Medina. The early scholars disagree as to the date at which the Qibla was changed in this year. The majority say it was changed halfway through Shaban, 18 months after the arrival of the Messenger of God in Medina. The Prophet turned toward Jerusalem for 16 months, and then it reached his ears that the Jews were saying, By God, Muhammad and his companions did not know where the Qibla was until we directed them. This displeased the Prophet, and he raised his face towards heaven. And God said, We have seen the turning of your face to heaven. Anyway, we continued to what Ibn Ashaq said. We went out with the polytheist pilgrims of our people, having prayed and learned the customs of the pilgrimage. With us was Albara bin Marur, our chief and senior. When we had started our journey from Medina, Albara said, I have come to a conclusion, and I don't know whether you agree with me or not. I think I will not pray and turn my back on this building, meaning the Kaaba, and that I shall pray towards it. We replied that so far as we knew, our prophet prayed towards Syria, and we did not wish to act differently. He said, I am going to pray toward the Kaaba. We said, but we will not. When the time for prayer came, we prayed toward Syria, and he prayed toward the Kaaba until we came to Mecca. We blamed him for what he was doing, but he refused to change. Then we came to Mecca, and he said to me, Nephew, let us go to the apostle and ask him what I did about on our journey. So we went into the mosque, and there was Al-Abbas sitting with the apostle beside him. We saluted them and sat down. Albara said, O prophet of God, I came on this journey having God guided me to Islam, and I felt that I could not turn my back on this building, so I prayed toward it, but when my companions opposed me, I felt some misgivings. What is your opinion, O apostle of God? He replied, You would have had a Qibla if you had kept to it. So Albara returned to the apostle's Qibla and prayed with us towards Syria. Honestly, this is probably the most damning piece of literature on the direction of the Qibla, and I bet very few Muslims know about it. Volumes of Abraham. This refers to forgeries that are mentioned in the Quran as being actual writings from God, called the Volumes of Abraham. This is certainly mentioned in the earlier scriptures, the scriptures of Abraham and Moses. Now, most people probably think this is a reference to the Old Testament, but these verses actually refer to a book called the Volumes of Abraham. Here's an excerpt from the book, The Balance of Truth, which explains the reasoning. When discussing the tribes of Ad and Tamud, you'll remember that Tamud rejected the camel prophet, we read, The existence of the ancient Arab tribes of Ad and Tamud is known to us from what two ancient Greek writers, Ptolemy and Diodorus Siculus, tell us about them. To the information thus afforded, the Quran adds very little that can be considered historical. Many great discoveries of recent times have completely confirmed what the Bible tells us about the far more ancient nations of Egypt, Babylonia, and Assyria, but no such discoveries have corroborated what the Quran says about Ad and Tamud. Hence, learned men think it highly probable that what Muhammad taught about these tribes was taken from the books of the Sabians, which the Quran calls the volumes of Abraham. Muhammad seems afterward to have discovered that these volumes were forgeries, and therefore, about four years after his claim to be a prophet, he ceased to mention them. Pharaoh's daughter. Here's a small detail the Quran just simply gets incorrect about the story of Moses. We inspired the mother of Moses. Nurse him then when you fear for him. Cast him into the river and do not fear nor grieve. We will return him to you and make him one of the messengers. Pharaoh's household picked him up to be an opponent and a sorrow for them. Pharaoh, Haman, and their troops were sinners. Pharaoh's wife said, An eye's delight for me and for you. Do not kill him. Perhaps he will be useful to us, or we may adopt him as a son. But they did not foresee. It wasn't Pharaoh's wife that gathered up the baby Moses, but his daughter. Reading the first few verses of Exodus 2 tell us that. And now we yet again get to the question of if the Bible has been corrupted. That's what the Muslims would say, of course, in response to that. But more on that later, I promise. Golden Calf 
This refers to, well, one of the most well-known Bible stories of the golden calf. And guess what? The Quran gets it wrong again. He said, We have tested your people in your absence, and the Sumerian misled them. They said, We did not break our promise to you by our choice, but we were made to carry loads of the people's ornaments, and we cast them in. That was what the Sumerian suggested. So he produced for them a calf, a mere body which load. And they said, This is your God, and the God of Moses, but he has forgotten. The Quran says that a Sumerian was the one that misled Israel to worship the golden calf. There's a small problem here. You know, Samaria didn't exist at that time. Samaria is the Hellenized version of the name Shamron, used for the central region of Israel. Here's a map of it compared with Egypt and Mount Sinai. There is a debate about which mountain actually is the historical Sinai, but all of them are on or near the Sinai Peninsula. Samaria is nowhere close geographically speaking. Drinking water. Apparently, a certain number of warriors of Saul were selected by observing the manner in which they drank water. This Quran story says, When Saul marched forth with his army, he cautioned, Allah will test you with the river. So whoever drinks his fill from it is not with me, and whoever does not taste it except a sip from the hollow of his hands is definitely with me. They all drink their fill except for a few. When he and the remaining faithful with him crossed the river, they said, Now we are no match for Goliath and his warriors. But those believers who were certain they would meet Allah reasoned, How many times has a small force vanquished a mighty army by the will of Allah? And Allah is always with the steadfast. This is all well and good, it's a fine story, except that it's not actually attributed to Saul in reality. This happened during the time of Gideon. Early in the morning, Jerubal, that is Gideon, and all the men with him camped beside the spring of Herod. So Gideon brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to them, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel to drink. And the number of those who lapped the water with their hands to their mouths was three hundred men. All the others knelt to drink. Then the Lord said to Gideon, With the three hundred men who lapped the water, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand, but all the others are to go home. As we will also see later, the Quran is supposed to be the protector of the Bible. But if the Bible got corrupted, and the Quranic story is the correct one here, then the Quran failed to do its job. But for now, we'll move on to level 3. This level is where a lot of cracks start to show in the armor of Islam. Satan peeing. This refers to exactly what it sounds like. Sunan and Nasai, 1608, Asahi Hadith says, It was narrated that Abdullah said, Mentioned was made in the presence of the Messenger of Allah about a man who slept all night until morning. He said, That is a man in whose ear the shaitan has urinated. It was narrated that Abdullah said, A man said, O Messenger of Allah, so and so slept and missed the prayer yesterday until morning came. He said, The shaitan has urinated in that one's ears. Notice that both of these are graded sahih. They're legitimate statements of Muhammad as far as the scholars are concerned. You remember earlier when Muhammad apparently choked Satan? Who had, you know, a physical body. Well, if he does this to tons of people around the world, assuming people sleep in in the morning, does that mean he's omnipresent at the same time? How does that work? Is the urine spiritual or material urine? Why would urine in the ear also keep somebody asleep rather than wake them up immediately? Allah knows best, I guess. Nose washing. This refers to one of the rituals Muslims perform called wudu. It involves washing of the whole face in the morning, including shooting water up your nose. This is done three times. Do you ever wonder why this is a requirement? Well, Satan's been playing with you again. Sahih al-Bukhari 3295 Narrated Abu Huraira The Prophet said if any of you rouses from sleep and performs the ablution, he should wash his nose by putting water in it and then blowing it out thrice because Satan has stayed in the upper part of the nose all night. Preaching punishment. This refers to the punishment that Allah apparently was to give Muhammad if he didn't preach. From Ibn Ashaq we read, When these words, Warn thy family, thy nearest relations, came down to the apostle, he called me and said, God has ordered me to warn my family, my nearest relations, and the task is beyond my strength. I know that when I made this message known to them, I should meet with great unpleasantness. So I kept silence until Gabriel came to me and told me that if I did not do as I was ordered, my Lord would punish me. 
If Muhammad was sent by Allah to be the final prophet to mankind, why was he so reluctant? The reaction from Allah is downright evil. The all-caring, all-knowing, all-wise ruler of the universe, the merciful, apparently has to threaten Muhammad to do his bidding? This doesn't make sense, and it's pretty embarrassing for the founder of one of the world's largest religions. Birth control. Maybe this one is what you think it is, maybe you isn't. Regardless, it's weird and it's really gross. So apologies when I read this. Let's dive into some more hadith. Sahih Muslim 1438a and c. O oh, Abu Sa'id, did you hear Allah's messenger mentioning Al-Azl? He said yes and added, we went out with Allah's messenger on the expedition to the Bil Mustalik and took captive some excellent Arab women, and we desired them, for we were suffering from the absence of our wives. But at the same time, we also desired ransom for them. So we decided to have sexual intercourse with them, but by observing azal, which means withdrawing the male sexual organ before a mission of semen to avoid conception, but we said, we are doing an act, whereas Allah's messenger is amongst us, why not ask him? So we asked Allah's messenger, and he said, It does not matter if you do not do it, for every soul that is to be born up to the day of resurrection will be born. We took women captives, and we wanted to do azal with them. We then asked Allah's messenger, may peace be upon him, about it, and he said to us, Verily you do it, verily you do it, verily you do it. But the soul which has to be born until the day of judgment must be born. No doubt these men left the pregnant women to fend for themselves and their children without any help because, you know, they weren't married. And just in case you thought this wasn't that important, here's two more hadith on the subject, one of which is graded Sahih. Sadly, there's a lot more weird and gross stuff ahead, and I'm sorry for having to read it, but hey, you clicked on the video. On we go. Dusty Mouths. This account isn't so gross, at least physically, but it's just an example of more odd conduct from the apparent best man in history. Sahih Muslim 935a. Aisha reported that when the Messenger of Allah was told that Ibn Haritha, Jafar bin Abu Talib, and Abdullah bin Rawaha were killed, he sat down showing signs of grief. She further said, I was looking at him through the crevice of the door. A man came to him and mentioned that Jafar's women were lamenting. He, the holy prophet, commanded him to go and forbid them to do so. So he went away but came back and told him that they did not obey him. He commanded him a second time to go and forbid them to do so. He again went but came back and said, I swear by God, messenger of Allah, that they have overpowered us. She, Aisha, said that she thought the messenger of Allah had told her to throw dust in their mouths. Thereupon Aisha said, May Allah humble you. You did not do what Allah's messenger ordered you, nor did you stop annoying Allah's messenger. May peace be upon him. So Jafar bin Abu Talib died, and the messenger of Allah was grieving. Okay, fine. A man told him Jafar's wives were mourning as well. But instead of comforting them, he ordered that they be stopped. When they didn't listen twice, they had dust thrown in their mouths to stop them from wailing. What kind of monster does that to grieving women? House flies. If you've seen the miniseries Islamicize Me, you already know about this one. It's another gross rule Muslims have to follow. Sunan Abu Dawud 3844. Abu Hurairah reported the Messenger of Allah as saying, When a fly alights in anyone's vessel, he should plunge it all in, for in one of its wings there is a disease, and in the other there is a cure. It prevents the wing of it, which there is a cure, so plunge it all in the vessel. Sahih Abu Khari 3320. Narrated Abu Hurairah. The Prophet said, if a fly falls in the drink of any one of you, he should dip it in the drink and take it out, for one of its wings has a disease and the other has the cure for the disease. Notice that there's a slight difference in these two hadith. The second one mentions taking out the fly, but the first one, the Sahi one, doesn't. Yeah, this is gross, but it's also practically ridiculous. Imagine a fly that lands on the rim of your glass and starts drinking some of the soda you have. Are you supposed to make sure you're fast enough to plunge the whole fly in your drink? What if you miss? Do you then need to pour out the whole drink just in case only the disease got in there? Cleaning stones. This refers to yet another gem from Islamicize Me. Sunan Abu Dawood 7. It was said to Solomon, your prophet teaches you everything, even about excrement. He replied, yes. He has forbidden us to face the Qibla at the time of easing or urinating, and cleansing with right hand, and cleansing with less than three stones, or cleansing with dung or bone. 
Sahih al-Bukhari 161, narrated Abu Huraira, the Prophet said, Whoever performs ablution should clean his nose with water by putting the water in it and then blowing it out, and whoever cleans his private parts with stones should do it with odd number of stones. And again, the Sahih reference does us in. The second hadith seems to make an allowance for cleaning your butt with some stones as long as it's an odd number. But the Sahih hadith requires you to use more than three stones whenever you clean yourself. How exactly is that supposed to be hygienic? And what about people in circumstances that don't have access to the right kind of stones? This is the kind of thing that shows Islam is a religion for the 7th century, and it should have stayed there. Camel fluid. Oh boy, this is one of the more gross hadiths. Can you guess which fluid of the camel I'm referring to? Sahih al-Bukhari 5686. Narrated Anas. The climate of Medina did not suit some people, so the Prophet ordered them to follow his shepherd, i.e. his camels, and drink their milk and urine as a medicine. So they followed the shepherd, that is the camels, and drank their milk and urine till their bodies became healthy. We're going to skip over the second half of this hadith and come back to it later, because that part is way worse than the first half. But the first half isn't great either. Vomiting commanded. Yes, you heard me right. This is a reference to vomiting being commanded. Sahih Muslim 2026. Abu Huraira reported Allah's messenger as saying, None of you should drink while standing, and if anyone forgets, he must vomit. Say somebody has some kind of disease and they have sores on their backside and they can't sit down. Are they just not allowed to drink anymore? What about drinking while you're laying down? What about drinking while you're upside down? Now I sound like Dr. Seuss. Impure water. This refers to the idea in Islam that nothing ever makes water impure. Ever. Nothing. Jami at Termidi, 66. Abu Sa'id al Kutri narrated, It was said, O oh Allah's Messenger, shall we use the water of Buddha well to perform ablution, while it is a well in which menstruation rags, flesh of dogs, and the putrid are dumped? Allah's Messenger said, Indeed, water is pure. Nothing makes it impure. Muhammad writes. This refers to the idea that Muhammad actually wrote some stuff, despite the popular Muslim belief that apparently Muhammad couldn't write. The miracle of the Quran is supposed to be that it was sent down to an illiterate man, yet the message got through via a sound chain of oral narration and was later written down. From Ibn Ashaq, when the apostle reached Tabuk Yuhana bin Ruba, governor of Ayla, and came and made a treaty with him and paid the poll tax, the people of Jarba and Adruf also came and paid the poll tax. The apostle wrote for them a document which they still have. So why don't modern Muslims know about this? What else has been hidden from you? 16 Privileges This refers to the 16 privileges that Muhammad gets over and above all other men. This comes from the Tafsir of Kurtubi. The Tafsir is like a commentary on the Quran, and I could really only find it in Arabic, so bear with me and Google on the English translation. As for what was permissible for him, may God bless him and grant him peace. There are 16 in total. First, the best of the spoils. Second, taking possession of one-fifth of one-fifth, or of one-fifth. Third, continuing. Fourth, having more than four wives. Fifth, marriage is in the form of a gift. Sixth, marriage without a guardian. Seventh, marriage without a dowry. Eighth, his marriage while in a state of Iram. Ninth, the division between spouses is dropped from him, and this will come. Tenth, if his sight falls on a woman, her husband must divorce her, and it is permissible for him to marry her. Ibn al-Arabi said, This is what the Imam of the two sanctuaries said, and what the scholars have said in the story of Zayd of this meaning has already passed. Eleventh, he freed Safiya and made her freedom her dowry. Twelfth, entering Mecca without being in a state of Iram, and there was a difference of opinion regarding this. Thirteenth, fighting in Mecca. Fourteenth, he does not inherit. This was mentioned in the section on analysis because if a man approaches death due to illness, most of his property is taken away from him, and he is left with only one-third pure, and the property of the messenger of God, may God bless him and grant him peace, remains as stated in the verse on inheritance, and Surah Maryam also explains it. Fifteenth, his marriage remains after death. Sixteenth, if he divorces a woman, his prohibition on her remains, so she cannot marry.
Do these sound like things allowed to a selfless, good-hearted, caring man? These are the most carnal things I can think of. Well, except for the stuff in level 8, but we'll get there later. They're an allowance to do all sort of traditionally unclean things. Why does the Almighty God have to make so many exceptions for one man? Why does it seem like Allah is Muhammad's genie in a bottle? Satan's Wind Allah's Apostle said, When the Adhan is pronounced, Satan takes to his heels and passes wind with noise during his flight in order to not hear the Adhan. Hey, I'd, I'd agree with Muslims that Satan is pretty gross in general, but why does this have to be an official teaching for Islam? This is kind of dumb. Does the farting make Satan faster? Or is it just done to cover up the sound of the call to prayer? Abrogation This refers to the concept of abrogation, which, of course, all Muslims would know about, and many non-Muslims actually have heard about it. But it's all the way down here because I think it's a rather big loophole in Islam. So let's read the Quran verses first, and then I'll explain. Indeed, we have sent down to you, O Prophet, clear revelations, but none will deny them except the rebellious. When we replace a verse with another, and Allah knows best what he reveals, they say, You, Muhammad, are just a fabricator. In fact, most of them do not know. Recite what has been revealed to you from the book of your Lord. None can change his words, nor can you find any refuge beside him. Chapter 18, verse 27 says that no one can change the words of God. So why does God need to change his words through abrogation? And on top of that, as chapter 2, verse 99 says, the revelations in the Quran are supposed to be very clear. If that's also true, why do they need to be replaced in abrogation? Atonement. This refers to the concept of atonement in Islam. I'm going to touch on this more later for a different reason, but for now let's just read some Quran and Hadith and see what happens. Say, O Prophet, should I seek a Lord other than Allah while he is the Lord of everything? No one will reap except what they sow. No soul burdened with sin will bear the burdens of another. Then to your Lord is your return, and he will inform you of your differences. Okay, great. Now we know that one person who bears his own sins can't bear another's sins. This is why Muslims say Islam is a just and accountable religion, since everyone is accountable for his own sins. Sahih Muslim 2767a Abu Musa reported that Allah's messenger said, When it will be the day of resurrection, Allah would deliver to every Muslim a Jew or a Christian and say, That is your rescue from hellfire. Sahih Muslim 2767b Abu Burda reported on the authority of his father that Allah's apostle said, No Muslim would die, but Allah would admit in his stead a Jew or a Christian in hellfire. Sahih Muslim 2767d Abu Burda reported Allah's messenger as saying, There would come people among the Muslims on the day of resurrection with heavy sins as a mountain, and Allah would forgive them and would place in their stead the Jews and the Christians. Sinless man. We've already talked about how Muhammad had a lot of carnal allowances. Aside from that, which many Muslims probably don't know about, they say, hey, he's a sinless man, at least after he became a prophet. Mishkat al-Masabi 942. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq said that he asked God's messenger to teach him a supplication to use in his prayer, and he told him to say, O oh God, I have greatly wronged myself, and thou can alone canst forgive sins, so grant me forgiveness from thee, and show mercy to me. Thou art the forgiving and the merciful one. Mishkat al-Masabi 2482, O oh God, forgive me my former and my latter sins, which I have kept secret and why I have done openly. Mishkat al-Masabi 731, Mishkat al-Masabi 871, Mishkat al-Masabi 893, Mishkat al-Masabi 1305. Why does the Messenger of Allah need to have his sins forgiven if they say that he's sinless after becoming a prophet? Clearly this is after because he's talking to Aisha about all this. If he's in a shaky position when it comes to his place before God, how can any Muslim walk around with any confidence in his faith whatsoever if Muhammad is the best of people? Hey, but don't worry. The scholars have found a way around this little difficulty God made for them. Ibn Taymiyyah said, The belief that the prophets are free of major sins but not of minor sins is the opinion of the majority of Islamic scholars and of all Muslim groups. It is the opinion of most commentators on the Quran, scholars of Hadith, and jurists. What exactly qualifies as a minor sin? Rather than committing minor sins, Muhammad committed sins with a minor. And we will get to that later. Prophet's sins. 
This is about the prophets prior to Muhammad committing grave sins as according to Islam. We said, O Adam, inhabit the garden, you and your spouse, and eat from it freely as you please, but do not approach this tree, lest you become wrongdoers. But Satan caused them to slip from it, and caused them to depart the state they were in. Thus Adam disobeyed his Lord and fell. And when Moses returned to his people, angry and disappointed, he said, What an awful thing you did in my absence. Did you forsake the commandments of your Lord so hastily? And he threw down the tablets, and he took hold of his brother's head, dragging him towards himself. He said, My Lord, forgive me and my brother, and admit us into your mercy, for you are the most merciful of the merciful. This happens after the golden calf situation at Mount Sinai. Why does Moses need to ask God for forgiveness if it was only some kind of minor sin they committed and if Aaron was the one who had done it? Moving on to Joseph now in Potiphar's house. If you remember correctly, Potiphar's wife tried to seduce Joseph. She in whose house he was living tried to seduce him. She shut the doors and said, I am yours. He said, God forbid, he is my Lord. He has given me a good home. Sinners never succeed. She desired him, and he desired her. In the biblical story, Joseph keeps himself clean and doesn't fall to Potiphar's wife's seduction. But here in the Quran, it says that he did desire her, which is a form of adultery. That's a big problem, isn't it? Or maybe that's just one of those minor sins they keep talking about. Now, on to Abraham. Praise be to God, who has given me in my old age Ishmael and Isaac. My Lord is the hearer of prayers. Our Lord Forgive me and my parents and the believers on the day the reckoning takes place. And now back to Moses again during the time of the Exodus. Go to Pharaoh and say, We are the messengers of the Lord of the worlds. Let the children of Israel go with us. He said, Did we not raise you among us as a child, and you stayed among us for many of your years? And you committed that deed you committed, and you were ungrateful. Pharaoh mentions a deed that Moses committed which wasn't good. Once he entered the city, unnoticed by its people, he found in it two men fighting, one of his own sect and one from his enemies. The one of his sect solicited his assistance against the one from his enemies, so Moses punched him and put an end to him. He said, This is of Satan's doing. He is an enemy that openly misleads. He said, My lord, I have wronged myself, so forgive me. So he forgave him. Moses murdered a man and then attributed it to Satan. He then asks forgiveness. And now we get to Jonah. And Jonah was one of the messengers. When he fled to the laden boat, he gambled and lost. Then the fish swallowed him, and he was to blame. So everybody knows the story of Jonah being swallowed by the fish and all that kind of stuff. But apparently Jonah was to blame for the things that happened to him, according to God. He didn't do what God wanted him to do. Is this not also a big sin? Disobeying God? Not submitting to God? And now we get to David. This brother of mine has 99 ewes, and I have one ewe. And he said, Entrust it to me, and he pressured me with words. He said, He has done you wrong by asking your you in addition to his use. Many partners have taken advantage of one another, except those who believe and do good deeds. But those are few. David realized that we were testing him, so he sought forgiveness from the Lord, and fell down to his knees and repented. So we forgave him for that, and for him is nearness to us, and a good place of return. David had to pray, repent, and ask forgiveness for what he did with Bathsheba. If everybody knows the biblical story, you know what I'm talking about. Again, this is a big problem for those who say the prophets were sinless. The Bible doesn't say the prophets were sinless. Only Muslims do. I know I've been talking a lot on this one, but there's only two left, Noah and Solomon. First, we get to Solomon. We tested Solomon and placed a body on his throne. Then he repented. He said, my Lord, forgive me, and grant me a kingdom never to be attained by anyone after me. You are the giver. Solomon had to repent as well. Repentance is not necessary if someone is sinless. Noah said, My Lord, do not leave of the unbelievers a single dweller on earth. If you leave them, they will mislead your servants and will breed only wicked unbelievers. My Lord, forgive me and my parents and anyone who enters my home in faith, and all the believing men and believing women, and do not increase the wrongdoers except in perdition. Are we surprised to see that there's a contradiction here in Islam? True religion. This refers to the concept of what the actual true religion is in Islam. And guess what? It's not such a clear picture. Muslims today certainly wouldn't say that there are multiple paths to the same God. Islam is about submission, and the closest thing you can have to a relationship with God is being his slave. Islam is the true religion, and everyone else must be subjugated or killed until only Islam remains. If that's the case, 
Why does the holy book of the Muslims allow for other religions to be true as well? Indeed, the believers, Jews, Christians, and Sabians, whoever truly believes in Allah and the last day and does good, will have the reward with their Lord, and there will be no fear for them, nor will they grieve. Chapter 3, verse 79 of the Quran clearly reads that Allah is the only one to be worshipped. But chapter 2, verse 62, says that anyone who truly believes in Allah, even if they are Jews, Christians, or Sabians, can enter paradise. Well, that's it for now. But hey, you made it through levels 1 through 3. It gets so much worse the further we go down, so look out for those. I'll hopefully have those videos out soon. Alright, see you guys later.